it's my pleasure this evening to welcome Dr. Park from Bristol University, who is going to be telling us about the rather unusual subject of how our minds have been shaped by pathogens. So, Justin, to you. Thank you, Don. Um, so thank you for inviting me to give this talk, um, this uh, very beautiful venue. Um, just to tell you a bit about myself. So my, I'm Justin Park. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology um, at the University of Bristol. Um, I, I was originally born in South Korea and I moved to Canada as a child uh, with my family. And I completed my undergraduate studies and my master's and PhD there. And then I had my first job in the Netherlands at the University of uh, Groningen. Um, that's how you guys say their G's. <laughs> um, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, some of you saw her playing the piano earlier. She's a pianist. And then we've been in Bristol um, since 2008. So I've lived in four different countries across three continents. And I think that's given me a good perspective on the kinds of things that are universal across humans and the kinds of things that differ across human cultures. So um, obviously there are many differences on the surface, but if you dig a bit deeper, um, humans in most places share very fundamental motives, um, desires, fears, and so on. So I think, um, um, that's where the evolutionary perspective becomes very useful in making sense of what kinds of things um, drive human thought and behavior. So um, I was asked to give a talk on how evolutionary theory has um, influenced the study of psychology. And I'm going to do that by focusing on this very specific topic of how pathogens may have shaped um, humans and human cultures. Now, I'm not a virologist or a biologist, so I don't know much about um, pathogens or germs um, and how, how they operate. Um, all I know is that uh, they're, they're bad things. You know, we've seen from the pandemic how uh, the things that they can um, uh, cause. But I have uh, been looking at um, the ways in which the selection pressure in, uh, imposed by pathogens over many generations could have shaped human motives and the kinds of um, implications these motives can have in our everyday thoughts and behavior. Uh, some of this is speculative. Some of this has uh, some evidence behind it. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and um, points of discussion at the end, and there should be plenty of time for that. So um, I'm sure all of you are aware of Darwin's theory of natu um, evolution by natural selection, the idea that um, uh, animals, species, um, uh, individuals vary in their traits, in their um, physical anatomy and their physiological traits, um, including um, their psychological and behavioral traits. And some of this variation just happens to be genetically um, heritable, meaning they are inherited through um, genetics. And where they um, can make a difference to survival and reproduction, they can be selected. And so this then leads to um, the accumulation of certain traits over time, over generations. So you've seen examples like the giraffe's long neck, um, which um, uh, can be advantageous um, in terms of foraging. And we see um, behavioral instincts like the spider's ability to weave these really complex webs, um, and bowerbirds building uh, these nests, and um, a lot of um, waterfowl are known to um, show these things called fixed action patterns. Um, in this example, um, where a mother a goose or a bird um, when they see an egg that's rolled away from their nest, this triggers this behavior to go over and nudge it back into their nest. And so this behavioral sequence seems, seems to be an adaptation to make sure that their eggs don't stray too far. What's interesting about these um, behaviors is that you can kind of study the specific cues that trigger these um, sequences. So scientists have um, gone over to these nests and have placed objects that look like eggs. Sometimes they can be mm -hmm. as different as like colorful cubes and, and these birds will sometimes be fooled into um, nudging those back into their nests. So it's not that they're aware that these objects are their eggs. It's just that they have these um, really simple heuristic um, mechanical programs that trigger these actions. So if you think about this in the context of human behavior, it doesn't seem that we have these really simple instincts like um, nudging eggs back into our nests, but we can think of um, perhaps more uh, complex emotional programs that may do something similar in terms of um, at a very conceptual level. So I will show you many examples of uh, what, um, what that might look like. Um, so from the perspective of psychologists who study um, the mind from um, the evolutionary perspective, the mind can be seen as a collection of functionally specialized mechanisms. So it's not that we have this 
kind of amorphous unitary thing called the mind, but within it, there are these um, numerous more specific mechanisms that underlie more specific behaviors, those that pertain to finding food, those that pertain to um, making alliances, uh, finding mates, um, avoiding dangers, and so on. So these will then involve various perceptual, cognitive. Cognitive just means having to think about something and motivational processes. So if you um, uh, go for several hours without food, then this causes a state of hunger, this motivational state that makes you think about um, the ways in which you can obtain food. And then you start to notice things around you that pertain to um, you know, satiating that need. So all these systems get, get um, triggered. Um, but then once you are um, satiated from food, then th that motivational system shuts down and then your um, other systems might take over. So we, we can think of these different um, specialized mechanisms that underlie behaviors that generally promote our survival and reproduction. Um, so when you think of it this way, then um, anytime we have a behavioral trait that may have evolved, we can think of different levels of explanation. So psychologists talk about there being proximate and ultimate explanations. So if you look at the egg retrieval behavior in the bird that I just mentioned, um, you can think about the question of why does this happen? And at one level, it happens because the bird has noticed an object that looks like an egg and it's triggered that behavior. So you can then kind of work out the, the perceptual and the, the physiological pathways that give rise to that specific behavior. And that's approximate kind of explanation. But then as a biologist, you might wonder why does that exist in the first place? And you can say, well, um, that behavioral sequence um, helped that particular animal pass on their genes through protecting their eggs over um, alternative behaviors where they didn't protect the egg. So then that leads to um, a, a more a fuller account of the, the behavioral sequence. There's a proximate account and an ultimate account that um, explains why it evolved in the first place. And we can think of, about this for human behavior as well. Um, when we do things, what's the proximate explanation? Why do we do things? Which generally leads to uh, explanations focused on mechanisms, the triggers, cues, and so on, but also the ultimate, why does that um, exist in the first place? Another very interesting thing that psychologists have noted is that um, animals vary in the extent to which they are social, meaning they need um, um, to live uh, amongst conspecifics, members of their species, and humans turn out to be, um, are very highly social. So we are a very highly social species, um, uh, I think um, on par with you um, social species, uh, insect species like ants and bees. Um, on the other hand, there are species that are not social where they can do just fine being solitary except coming together for mating purposes. But humans seem to be very social um, in the sense that uh, throughout evolution, humans could not survive without others. You may have heard of um, the social brain hypothesis proposed by the anthropologist Robin Dunbar. Um, he has argued that primates evolved these big brains in large part because we had to live in groups and that led to um, these pressures that made us um, require these uh, um, complex brains to deal with all the information that you have to deal with in big groups. And based on his research, um, Dunbar has even suggested that there's a natural group size for humans uh, known as Dunbar's number of 150. There's a lot of discussion about what that number actually means, but the key point is humans are a social species and we seem to do well in groups of a few dozen people in terms of like our daily activities. And if you think about the psychological adaptations for sociality, we have things like attachment, um, especially between um, parents and infants. Um, when you study psychology, people um, ask you whether you can read minds. In fact, most humans can do this. Um, if you, uh, let's say right now, someone runs into this room runs around and runs out, then you'll be trying to mind read. What was the person doing? Were they looking for something? Were they looking for the toilet? Um, depending on the way they moved and uh, you, you try to figure these things out. So we are mind reading all the time uh, based on um, expressions, nonverbal cues. Um, and there's in fact a theory that people that are not able to mind read naturally are on the um, autism spectrum. Um, social perception, the ability to quickly scan people and figure out things like their gender, um, their race, age, um, their personality, their current mood states. These are things that we do naturally. And these things exist because they serve them um, useful functions for humans over evolutionary time. And there are more complex things like the ability to cooperate in large groups. So 
we can um, have events like this because of the human ability to cooperate and organize um, things. Now, sociality evolved because it's uh, very useful for animals, um, including humans, but it also introduces um, a new set of problems. So if you live amongst other individuals now, um, sometimes some individuals may try to um, gain things from you without giving back. So there may be exploitation, free riding. Um, in more extreme cases, there may be threats to your safety. And of course, if you um, uh, are a, um, an organism um, li living amongst other conspecifics, there's always the chance of disease transmission. So then these problems will have led to a new set of adaptations over time to deal with them, um, to try to, to manage these problems. So I'm going to focus on disease transmission as the, the focal threat and the kinds of adaptations that may have evolved in response to that threat. So here's a question for you. If you think about things like feces, rotting meat, um, open wounds, Obviously, these things are not pleasant. I've spared you having to look at images of these, but just thinking about them, um, you'll feel some aversion. And one question can be, why do we feel aversion to these things like feces and so on? And your immediate um, intuition might be, well, these things are disgusting, right? They're disgusting and that's why we don't like them. Now, this is kind of approximate type of explanation. We're focusing on the immediate reaction, um, the immediate cues in the, in the environment. Um, but we might then wonder, um, what does it mean for something to be disgusting? So we're trying to look for a, a deeper cause of this particular uh, motivational state. So why does disgust exist in the first place? This is something that Charles Darwin himself uh, thought about way back in the um, 1800s. And um, in one passage, he noted that disgust is a reaction to something revolting, primarily in relation to the sense of taste, as actually perceived or vividly imagined. But you can, if you look at that and think about it carefully, you can kind of see that Darwin didn't actually get past the proximate explanation part, because all he said is something is disgusting if it's revolting. Okay, so that's just a synonym for disgust. So why is something revolting? Why does um, disgust exist? Why are some things revolting? Um, so more recently in the last um, maybe two or three decades, um, different groups of psychologists have argued that this reaction to um, things like feces and um, you know, rotting meat and so on are um, adaptations against disease transmission. So if you think about the, um, the evolutionary logic behind what disgust might be, you can think about um, the origins of the response. And um, we know that as long as organisms have been around, there have also been pathogens, these smaller organisms that infiltrate bigger ones. Uh, cause damage and uh, use the the mechanisms of the bigger organisms to to uh, pass themselves on. And of course, we're very familiar with um, one particular pathogen from the last three years, the coronavirus. So these things have been around for uh, you know billions of years, and over time, the host organisms also evolved defenses. So we know um, that we have physical barriers um, on the skin and so on. There are chemical defenses um, just beneath the skin. And of course, the immune system is a, a prime example of how animals evolved very complex adaptations against disease. Um, our immune systems are really amazing things. And um, by figuring out how, how these things work, we've come up with um, things like you know, vaccinations. But what's interesting is um, animals are able to move around. So it's very likely that animals also evolved behavioral defenses. And the reason for this is um, while immune systems are amazing and very um, functional, they also cost a, a lot of resources. When you go in, when you're actually sick and your immune system has to um, uh, kick up and try to uh, combat these pathogens, you have to go through a period of illness, you have a fever response, it uses up a lot of energy, you're not able to do other things that are adaptive for you. Um, so it's it would be useful if you can avoid becoming infected in the first place. Basically, you know, if you can social distance all the time and make sure that we don't catch anything. So it's been proposed, and this was proposed long before. Um, the pandemic and social distancing, that animals likely evolved these tendencies. And it would be useful then if animals could figure out what things out there, um, including members of my own species, may be um, a risk for uh, passing on disease. Then you can avoid them more selectively instead of avoiding everything out there. So then you can talk about the functional components of this. 
So as animals, um, animal behaviors uh, usually underpinned by psychological mechanisms like perception and cognition and emotion, what are the things that underlie av avoidance behavior? So there's going to be some system for detecting pathogens, um, uh, this aversive response that motivates actual avoidance, and finally, the actual behavior avoidance. And then as a social psychologist, I've been interested in the various implications of these mechanisms for things like um, our attention, perception, emotion, memory, um, even beliefs and attitudes. So these are now much more complex, very highly human things, but um, I'll show you how these uh, things all relate to, to the psychology of disease avoidance. Now, I'll be talking about some of my own research and um, that of uh, other colleagues and other psychologists. Um, you'll see references to specific papers uh, with the names and dates. If you want to find out more about those things, um, just feel free to contact me um, by email, which I'll show you at the end, and I'll be free to, um, I'll be happy to share these papers with you and answer any further questions. So just to show you one um, a bit of uh, work here. So this was a paper that uh, my PhD supervisor, Mark Schaller, and I wrote, um, published back in 2011. Um, and Mark Schaller was actually the person who came up with this concept of the behavioral immune system, as, uh, an immune system that's not in the body, but um, uh, made possible by body movement. So the idea is that um, uh, there are systems for detecting cues that connote pathogens, which then activates um, disease-relevant emotional and uh, cognitive responses uh, leading to behavioral avoidance. So this was a review paper, and I'll be talking about some of the research from that paper. So first of all, um, how do you think we infer disease in other individuals? So um, if, you if you look at the bigger picture, of course, we, can, we know that there are um, uh, pathogens and things like feces and rotting food and so on. But let's uh, move beyond that and uh, think about how humans think of other humans. Um, a very simple and perhaps obvious hypothesis is that the system relies on perceptual cues, cues that we can detect through our senses. And these are these cues will usually be some symptoms of disease. And if, when you see these symptoms, then um, those cues that are more relevant to disease then will be perceived as more disgusting. So here's a study from um, Val Curtis and her colleagues uh, from a couple of decades ago. They showed thousands of participants, this was through a BBC website, images um, in, in pairs where um, one image um, might be um, a bit less relevant to disease and one might be more relevant to disease. So this person looks like um, they might have like influenza. And here are two similar um, images of wounds. The one on the left looks more like a burn scar. The one on the right looks more like an actual um, um, possible contagious illness. And these numbers in green and in the green and red boxes show the, the mean scores for um, the um, perceivers' ratings of disgust. So these people that went through these websites and just uh, clicked on numbers between one and five in terms of how, how disgusting these images are, the ones that were seen to be more disease relevant were judged to be more disgusting, perhaps not too surprisingly. So they had um, many more images like these, and it was they were all very consistent with the idea that the more disease relevant the image, the more disgusting they were uh, rated to be. And other psychologists have um, also proposed uh, ideas like um, uh, the effect of perceived contact between disgusting things. So when, when you think of one object as being disgusting, when that object touches something else, you think that this um, whatever made the first object disgusting has now passed, its, passed it on to the second object. So um, we have this idea of uh, you know, like germs being passed on through contact. We also have this idea of things that, looking like, that look like disgusting things are also disgusting. So Paul Rosen and colleagues have um, done these clever studies where they um, uh, bake um, chocolate fudge shaped to look like dog poo and offer it to people saying it's chocolate fudge, would you like to eat this? And very often if it's shaped like poo, then people uh, will refuse it. And this, there are similar studies like um, um, seeing if people are willing to um, drink out of a, a brand new um, toilet bowl or are willing to eat soup that's been stirred by a brand new fly swatter. It's just this idea of something contaminating food that makes people not want to eat these things. It's not because people have sophisticated ideas about something actually being transmitted. It's just a very intuitive response we have to things being contaminated. Um, the psychologist Stephen Pinker has noted um, 
that there's a difference between toxins and um, pathogens. Toxins are things that um, can also you know, taste bitter and be aversive, but very often we consume toxins um, like caffeine and alcohol very avidly. And it's because toxins have um, safe dosage levels, whereas microorganisms like viruses and bacteria have no safe level because they can proliferate, reproduce very quickly. So this is um, uh, from his book, How the Mind Works. He says, anything that touches a yucky substance is itself forever yucky. So long before um, humans had any um, scientific awareness of pathogens and how they work, we had this um, gut response to things that can be contaminating. And he calls this um, intuitive microbiology. Um, soon thereafter, so this is 2009, 2011, and uh, 2013, different groups of psychologists um, semi-independently came up with uh, theories for how disgust is an adaptation for disease. Um, so it may seem obvious to us now thinking about it, but before this, it wasn't very obvious at all why disgust exists. So um, the idea that disease, uh, disgust um, evolved to deal with disease is not a very um, uh, old idea. I don't know if you can see that. I will just see if I can move that a bit. So this up here says a signal detection problem. And um, this is a very important principle for how this system works. If you think about the way our um, physiological immune system works, um, you often get a, your body gets infiltrated by some um, external substance. It could be a pathogen, like a virus shown here. It might be pollen um, uh, that uh, resembles a pathogen. Now, these images are a bit misleading because in reality, pollen is a lot larger than viruses. But for some reason, um, some of our bodies, if you have hay fever, for example, seem to respond to pollen as though it was a pathogen. So now your body gets infiltrated by one of these things. It has to either decide, yes, it's um, something harmful and mount an immune response like sneezing, inflammation, and so on or decide that it's not harmful and not mounting a response, which then leads to four possible outcomes. If you've been infected by a pathogen and your body responds, that's great. You've got a true positive, um, your body deals with the pathogen. If your body is infected by pollen um, and you don't respond, that's a true negative. That's also good. You don't waste energy um, responding to something that's not going to harm you. But sometimes you have um, uh, what are known as false positives or false negatives. It may be the case that your, your body has taken in pollen and your immune system for some reason decides this is bad for me, so I'm going to respond to it by um, sneezing and, and so on. And you have a false, false positive where the body reacts to a harmless substance. A false negative is where you are um, infected by a pathogen and your body has decided that it's not a pathogen, so it does not respond. So as long as the system relies on um, imperfect cues to detect pathogens, there's going to be some degree of false positive, false negative errors. Now, if you think about which of these two are worse for you, I'm sure you can kind of guess um, which of these might be. So false positives are very unpleasant if you have um, hay fever, for example, but a false negative is not only unpleasant, but it can lead to illness or death. So a false negative is much worse. So the theory has um, that's been uh, proposed is that over many generations, when you have a situation like this, the perceptual systems will gradually evolve to become biased toward false positives to make sure that it doesn't ever have a false negative. It's a bit like the way our smoke detectors work in our homes where there's a slight false positive bias such that um, it may set off an alarm when you overcook your food or have a, an incident with your toaster, but it makes sure that it doesn't have any false negatives. So it doesn't miss actual fires, but it may have a lot of false positives. Now that's the immune system, but a very similar thing happens with um, our perceptual systems. So now here it says inferring disease from Q. Now let's say you're faced with this uh, person who has a, a facial a birthmark, a port wine stain. Um, and um, even without thinking about it, your perceptual system is going to have to decide very quickly, is that something that I can catch and that I want to avoid touching? Um, it may be a symptom of a contagious disease, or it may be just a, a burn scar, for example. And your system might infer disease and avoid the person, or your system might not infer disease and not avoid the person. 
again, we have the true positive, which would be good, a true negative, which would also be good, but also false positive and false negative responses. And for the, for the very same reason that the immune system has a false positive bias, this perceptual system will also have a, a false positive bias because it's better to avoid someone who's not harmful than fail to avoid somebody that could harm you. So um, this will tend to um, result in a situation where a wide range of cues that may not actually be symptoms of illness will trigger a, a kind of aversive disgust response. And it's been argued that this may explain um, the widespread stigma of uh, facial disfigurement and other um, disabilities and so on that are very visible. It's not that we have a conscious awareness that these things are contagious. It it's, uh, doesn't work at that level, but it's um, uh, this intuitive response that we have very often to avoid contact may come from the system having a false positive bias. So in a study that tried to test this more directly, so the, the title of the study was Facial Disfigurement is Treated Like an Infectious Disease. The researchers um, had actors um, either in the control condition or in a birthmark condition with a port wine stain on their face or in an influenza condition where they were made up to look like they had the flu. And the participants of the study came into a lab and they had to watch a video of, um, of uh, one of these three individuals. And they thought the study was about like um, uh, imitating behavior, how well they could do this. So there was no... Um, um, no comment made about the, the way they appeared. So they saw the video of the person handling a prop like um, uh, a snorkel um, goggles and um, the contact became progressively more intimate. So hand contact, head contact, face contact and oral contact. And then they were asked to um, go into the same room where they believed it was the same room with the same prop and try to imitate what they had just seen. So the question was, would they be less willing to do this if they had just seen the person with the birthmark or influenza um, to that same behavior. So this graph shows the number of um, the percentage of individuals in the study who um, carried through with the, um, imitating the behaviors through the four levels of contact. And the white bars show um, the contact for uh, imitating the control target, the gray bars show um, the levels for the birthmark target, and the black bars show it for the influenza target. You can see that for the first three levels, there isn't much of a difference up to the face, but when it came to oral contact, people are far more reluctant to do this, um, especially when they thought um, they were handling the object that had just been handled by somebody with a birthmark or influenza. So 81% were happy to do it when the, when the target was, uh, appeared healthy, but 64% and 60% um, were following through when they thought it was somebody with influenza or um, birthmark. They also had a, a, a set of blind judges who were uh, unaware of the purpose of the study, look at videos of the, the participants, participants themselves as they did these things and rate them in terms of um, how much disgust did they express in their face as they carried through with these behaviors? So as they picked up the goggles and put it on their um, uh, head and in their, in their mouth, did they show any um, disgust expressions and behaviors like you know, trying to um, uh, minimize the contact with the objects? And again, um, what you see is that when it came to the oral contact, um, there was far more dis um, discomfort, disgust uh, for the two um, uh, targets uh, with the birthmark and influenza compared to the control target. So these are um, clever ways of studying this behavior without asking people directly, just by observing their behavior, seeing the extent to which people treat the birthmark um, and influenza similarly. And there does seem to be some um, evidence for that. And this is a, a simpler study that I conducted with a couple of my previous students uh, in which we showed participants images of individu an individual with leprosy um, with like an amputated limb somebody who was uh, described as having been committed for armed robbery and a typical student. And the question was, how comfortable would you be engaging in physical uh, or non-physical contact? So physical contact might be, how comfortable would you be shaking hands with this person, hugging them, 
um, non-physical contact was, how, com how um, comfortable would you be um, having a phone conversation or emailing them? Now, the, the reason we included the armed robbery condition was to see if there was something specific about somebody, somebody who um, uh, poses a, a risk of disease. So people with, armed rob uh, people with a history of armed robbery might be stigmatized and might be seen as threatening, but for a disease ir irrelevant reason. So what you see here is for both physical and non-physical contact, the participants were kind of like, I don't want to deal with that person at all. But when it came to the person with leprosy, you see a much bigger difference between the physical and non-physical contact. They're generally happy to, to engage with them non-physically, but don't want to touch them. And of course, typical student, uh, there is low discomfort across both uh, types of time contact. And then we followed this up with um, a study in which we had a wider set of uh, target individuals, somebody described to be HIV positive, somebody with a facial birthmark, somebody who was um, extremely obese, someone with an amputated leg. And again, as a control condition, somebody with, somebody with a criminal record. And um, again, with the physical and non-physical types of contact. And what you see again is with um, somebody who poses a, a, a more general level of threat, somebody who's got a criminal record, you see high levels of discomfort for both types of contact. But for all the other ones, you see a much bigger difference. And the hypothesis we're trying to test here, of course, is that all these individuals may be perceived at some level um, as posing some threat of disease because of their appearance that's kind of non-normative non and non-acceptable to people. Now, there's going to be a lot of individual differences in these responses and some um, cultural and historical variation as well. So um, these are just averages that we found at this point in time. Yeah, so I just started talking about possible individual differences. And there are many reasons we see variation um, uh, that are relevant to um, evolutionary function. So whenever you have some adaptive response, um, it may confer benefits to you, but it may also come with costs. Um, avoiding people that may be contagious is, uh, is adaptive, but engaging in avoidance behavior means you use up your resources, your energy. Um, if you're concerned about catching pathogens, you may then kind of downregulate your other behaviors like you know, looking for food, finding friends, mates, and so on. So there's always a trade-off um, in terms of um, benefits and costs. And so what this means is these systems are likely to have evolved to be conditionally and flexibly turned on and off depending on when they're most likely to be useful. Um, in our physiological immune system, we have this very useful fever response where your body temperature goes up, which um, helps um, uh, get rid of pathogens in your body. But it also costs a lot of um, uh, a lot in terms of meta metabolic costs and um, your illness response and so on. So we don't have a permanent fever response, but the fever response comes on when it's most useful when you're actually infected. So in a very similar way, these behavioral avoidance responses, um, including the underlying discussed um, uh, responses, may be conditionally turned on um, by uh, various kinds of cues. Um, so it may be possible that um, some individuals uh, just have a kind of chronically activated um, sense of vulnerability to disease. And this may be because they had um, a history of an illness as, as they're growing up, um, or they've lived in uh, regions that are, that are more pathogen prevalent. And then there may be more temporary shifts in vulnerability to disease, depending on um, external environment. So if there's just been a disease outbreak where you live, or there's... Um, some media um, uh, story about a, a disease that's uh, spreading um, or just how contagious some disease appears to you, these kinds of information will then upregulate your disease avoidance response. So in terms of individual differences, um, uh, one line of research has looked into whether there might, might be kind of a disease avoidant personality trait or a set of traits. And if you think about our um, kind of fundamental personality traits, like um, something like, um, um, you know, introversion, extroversion, um, how neurotic you are. There are certain personality traits that you can think of as being more um, conducive to avoiding um, contact with disease uh, sources, like being highly neurotic. It's not a pleasant trait, but it will help you to um, um, stay away from diseases. People also differ in terms of how um, open they are to um, uh, kind of 
unrestricted sexual behavior. Um, so this is known as um, sociosexuality. And again, if you are more um, restrictive and in, in that is um, not as willing to engage in you know, casual sex, sexual behavior, this is going to be more conducive to avoiding diseases. And in fact, it's been found in studies that people who have higher concerns about disease and higher disgust tend to be also more neurotic and um, less open in their sexuality, in their sociosexuality. And also, um, even though personality traits are generally stable things, these things can be temporarily turned on, turned up and turned down. So um, in this one set of studies, it's been found that um, if you just temporarily remind people about the dangers of disease, they become somewhat less extroverted. Um, so they uh, have measured a, a bunch of different personality traits. And um, so not only do, do they become a bit more, um, but less extroverted, they also were more likely to show behavioral tendencies measured with these arm movements that showed um, a desire to avoid um, uh, these um, sources of disease. So just an example of how temporary shifts and disease salience can uh, shift our uh, responses to disease. Um, in one study that I conducted, uh, while I was teaching a group of psychology students, I had them measure their personal space. So personal space is the distance that um, um, you like to have between you and someone else as you're having a casual conversation. So we had students measure this with each other. And then I uh, also had them um, uh, complete a set of questionnaires to measure their disgust sensitivity, um, their personality traits, including introversion. And it was found that um, the more introverted someone is, the bigger, uh, personal space they prefer, which isn't too surprising, but also the more they, um, more disgust sensitive they were, the larger uh, per the personal space they preferred. But it was um, disgust sensitivity to um, uh, instances that are specific to other humans. So I'll show you what I might mean by that. So there's a questionnaire that we use in psychology um, called the disgust scale. And um, one set of them has these seven, seven um, items. And for each one, all you do is rate on a scale of um, um, one to seven, how disgusting that thing is to you. So stepping on dog poop, how disgusting would that be to you? Um, so on. If you look at the first three, they are things that don't have to do with other people, but the last four, they do have to do with um, other people. And if you separate the scores for those two, the human contaminants and um, disgust sensitivity is the part that is associated with um, the size of your personal space. So um, this is just an example of how a stable trait like um, um, personal space is correlated with the extent to which you are disgusted by um, human contaminants. So think about that next time you have a conversation, how close you prefer to stand next to someone. Um, in this paper, the title is uh, quite a mouthful, but um, we were trying to test this idea that um, even our perception of facial attractiveness may be associated with our disgust levels. And the reason this uh, was tested is uh, there's one um, idea that facial attractiveness is kind of a, a signal for underlying genetic and health quality. Um, there are various reasons why this is proposed, but... Um, the flip side of this is if someone appears to be very unattractive, this may potentially be a signal for ill health or um, at the very least the, that they may be more susceptible to pathogens and so on. Now, the idea we tested here was whether, um, not whether you want to avoid people that are unattractive, but whether your perception of an unattractiveness itself may be predicted by um, how easily you're disgusted. So we measure disgust sensitivity and then we had people just look at a bunch of images and rate them on a scale of one to 10. We're very good at doing this, um, giving people a score. And they're very, usually very um, consistent across raters. Um, and they can range you know, all the way from like down to two to up to eight, nine on average. And what we found here is if we take the subset of faces that were rated to be less attractive, and then if we um, look at those ratings across the perceivers in terms of their scores on the disgust scale, the perceivers who are more easily disgusted think those faces are less attractive. So this is why we said homeliness or, or unattractiveness is in the disgust sensitivity of the beholder. The more easily disgusted you are, the, the less attractive people appear to you. Um, 
out there. Um, so in terms of thinking about why these individual differences might exist, one possibility is that uh, these individual differences in disgust and our psychological responses may be a kind of complementary response to the physiological immune system. So our physiological immune system is generally very functional and good, but it can vary in its um, um, uh, usefulness. And sometimes this is by design. So um, in some cases, the immune system may be compromised through some other illness or, or deliberately suppressed as in um, the early part of pregnancy when women's bodies um, suppress their immune systems so that the body doesn't reject the, um, the embryo. So um, sometimes this happens by design. And when this happens, this seems to uh, upregulate the psychological uh, immune system just to make sure that people avoid um, sources of disease. So it's been found, uh, for example, that if you measure disgust sensitivity in women, um, it's elevated in the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, and this goes along with also nausea and morning sickness that we see in pregnant women. If you measure um, in non-pregnant women, their progesterone levels across um, their cycles. So this um, progesterone levels, uh, when they go up, the, the body uh, is being prepared for pregnancy. And also this seems to suppress the immune system. And this then is accompanied by an increase in disease avoidance tendencies like disgust. And they also measured um, uh, behavioral things like um, the tendency to you know, pull out hairs and so on. This also seems to accompany uh, this part of the cycle. And also, if you've um, had a long history of illness growing up, then your immune system is going to be more uh, vulnerable. This seems to then be accompanied by upregulated psychological tendencies. Um, in terms of um, more social kinds of uh, responses, now this is where things get more speculative and you may disagree with um, more of uh, the content here, and I'll be happy to have a discussion with you about this. Um, so basically, heightened disgust or concerns about disease, which may be a, a result of stable individual differences or through temporary salience, may then lead to stronger aversive responses to those with characteristics that can know disease. And those individuals are then the ones that I showed you earlier through those graphs, um, like people with facial birthmarks, um, amputated limbs, obesity, and so on. So I'm just showing you some examples from um, studies, disabilities, obese people, and also culturally foreign people. So now, if you look at, um, if you consider people with disabilities and people with obesity, these are physical things you can see, and you can kind of um, more easily make a link between those and um, the idea that there might be something in terms of disease uh, uh, transmission. But what, what about cultural foreignness? What, what does it have to do with disease? Um, well, in fact, foreigners are associated with disease um, in society. So throughout history, um, when different groups of people came into contact, they have often passed on diseases. Um, the clearest example being when the first Europeans went to North America, South America. Um, the majority of these Native Americans died not from deliberate killing, but through the, the passing on of um, European germs that these natives weren't uh, immune to. Um, so these things, so foreign cultures actually do pose th uh, disease threats um, uh, in many cases. And separate from that, um, each culture will have evolved through cultural evolution, various norms and practices pertaining to hygiene and food preparation. So the way that the various rituals that you go through to clean yourself, to prepare your food, um, you may do so without realizing where they come from, but very often they came through cultural evolution because they tended to promote hygiene and the suppression of disease transmission. Um, so when you come across individuals who do things very differently in terms of hygiene and food preparation, they will, they will very likely trigger kind of a, a disgust response. And a good example of this is just um, what different cultures think of as edible um, uh, in, in the animal kingdom. So there are some animals that are edible and some that are not. In fact, most animals are not edible and uh, a, a handful of species are considered edible. But the specific animals differ across cultures. So if you um, come across a culture where they eat a species that you don't eat, you think that's disgusting and vice versa. So then those people with these unfamiliar practices may be perceived at a very intuitive level 
um, to pose a disease risk, which may then contribute to things we know as xenophobia and um, other kinds of prejudices. So this was a study that was part of my PhD and also um, that of uh, my other colleagues, Jason Faulkner and Leslie Duncan. And we conducted a series of studies to test the idea that um, these disease avoidance motives may underlie xenophobic attitudes. And in some studies, we simply measured um, in surveys how, how um, concerned are you about disease, how prejudiced are you against these various groups, and we see correlations. In other cases, we um, uh, tried more um, experimental methods where we show people images of disease to make them temporarily concerned about catching diseases, and then seeing their responses in terms of um, um, so one measure was how open are you to these different immigrant groups? And what we found was generally there were um, links between disease avoidance motives and stronger anti-immigration attitudes, but it was more specific to these groups that were subjectively foreign. So this was done in Canada and um, in, in the city of Vancouver. And in Vancouver, um, there are, are you know, plenty of um, people of European background, but also plenty of people of East Asian background but not a lot of people from um, Africa or um, other uh, parts of the world. So what we find in this uh, population is they are more against immigration from those uh, groups that are more subjectively foreign, they're, that they're not familiar with, but especially when they're concerned about disease. And I think we've seen some examples of this um, in the early part of um, um, the pandemic, obviously. I'll see a bit more about that. And interestingly, many um, organizations that are um, specifically against immigration seem to have caught onto this link that people make between foreigners and disease. So many anti-immigration groups capitalize on this perceived link. So I'm just showing you some examples from web pages from years ago. So these aren't very up to date, but um, they are good examples. So there's a group called Migration Watch UK, and there's a section about HIV infection from overseas. This is a US uh, site um, that highlights the dark side of immigration. Um, diseases is a, a large section. This one is from Canada, immigration can kill you. Um, not subtle at all. <laughs> and um, throughout history, there have been various world leaders who have um, tried to make use of this perceived link between foreigners and diseases. Um, if you go back to the, the time of the Second World War, there was a lot of uh, war propaganda that linked um, those foreigners with uh, diseases. And obviously Donald Trump um, more, much more recently um, was saying these things. And then as I said, um, in the early part of the pandemic, there were um, a lot of uh, links made between um, disease threat and um, xenophobic responses. So now what's interesting for me is um, it's not just that people link, um, uh, the, it's not just that people respond with xenophobia to those specific individuals that may be objectively the source of disease, but this generalizes to others. So um, uh, I haven't seen all the data yet, but I suspect there was increased prejudice against all kinds of groups that are normally kind of stigmatized, but that were not really related to the pandemic at all, but just kind of got the, the overgeneralization effect, effect um, sp spilling out on them. And if you um, then think about uh, these xenophobic and prejudiced responses, you can see how this might link with political ideology. So if you look at people's more stable beliefs about um, how society should be structured and so on, um, and measure something like social conservatism, Many studies have shown um, correlations between the extent to which you are concerned about diseases on the one hand and how socially conservative you are, which kind of makes sense because social conservatism tends to go with um, being a bit more um, restricted in, their beha in your behavior, a bit more anti-immigration, uh, um, um, sticking to tradition, uh, negativity toward our groups, and so on. Earlier, I mentioned that there's a link between um, being pregnant and disgust responses. And that same group of researchers also did a follow-up study where they also measured um, uh, the extent to which these women were ethnocentric. So these were American women who were pregnant. And what they found was um, 
uh, an increase in being more patriotic um, at the same time that they're becoming more disgust sensitive through pregnancy. So uh, just by being pregnant, I mean, yeah, you, they saw these shifts um, in social attitudes. Um, so a lot of what I've talked about so far has focused on the, the psychological side um, about perception, um, emotion, motivation, and social attitudes. But more recently, people have tried to um, make sense of the behavioral, the psychological disease avoidance system in the context of what we already know about the immune system or generally. Because as I've been saying in some parts of my talk, it's not that um, these are two separate systems, but there may be a compensatory link. So if your uh, physiological system gets suppressed, your um, behavioral system may become upregulated. And, and the causal arrow may go the other way as well. It may be that when your psychological system is activated, this may also kind of um, trigger your physiological system to prepare itself for infection. So for example, let's say you come across um, someone who is coughing um, and you have this aversive response to that. Not only is this making you avoid the person at a behavioral level, this may uh, trigger your physiological system to prepare itself for infection which makes sense because if you see someone coughing, there's a good chance that you're gonna catch something. <clears throat> so in this study, um, the researchers showed uh, participants various images, which were either relevant to disease threat, like someone coughing, or um, relevant to disease irrelevant threats, like someone holding a gun towards you. And then they actually took blood samples to measure um, various markers of um, the, the physiological immune system being primed for infection. And they, they found evidence, and uh, um, as have others, that um, just looking at images relevant to disease seems to prime your uh, physiological system. And this has really interesting implications. Um, I don't know uh, the extent to which this may be um, practically useful, but it may be that just through looking at images or videos, um, you, you might be able to prepare your immune system for infection, sort of like a, a form of um, immunization. Um, this was a study conducted by my uh, recent PhD student who proposed that just looking at things that may um, make you feel disgusted, especially things that um, are ectoparasites, like in this case, maggots, um, or maggots look like that things that could be ectoparasites, may not only cause disgust, but actually make your skin more sensitive. You know, this feeling of something crawling on your back when you see something disgusting. This may be an actual phenomenon. So in this study, um, he had people uh, come in the lab and depending on which condition they were assigned to either look at a container of uh, live maggots. So that's on the left here. These were real maggots that were like, you know, squirming around in the container or in the control condition, a container of basmati rice. So similar kinds of things, but either very disease relevant or not. And then using these things called monofilaments, which are these um, thin uh, filaments of different um, uh, thickness, you can test people's uh, tactile sensitivity. How sensitive are you to touch? Um, and you do this with them not looking at their um, where they're being touched. It's, it's usually on the forearm, so it's not visible to them. And they have to indicate when they feel something being touched. So it's a very sensitive measure. It's often used by physiotherapists after injury to test your sensitivity. And um, I won't go into the details, but basically we found um, the effect we were looking for. So if you show people a box of maggots, their skin becomes more, much more sensitive um, afterwards. And we had a follow-up study to rule out the idea, the possibility that this was being caused by the smell of the maggots because they also have a smell. So in one study, we um, um, showed people videos of maggots and rice instead of the actual things. And we had very similar results. So just looking at maggots caused a similar response. In a further control, we showed people um, images of disease irrelevant threats, like um, I think it was like, an image of um, some riots going on in some city. So it's very threatening, but not disease relevant. And that had no effect on skin sensitivity. So it's very specific to something that could cause you um, disease or something that looked like a parasite. So we were very happy to put that phrase, making your skin crawl into the title of um, the article. Okay, so I mentioned um, probably in the abstract of the talk and in the title, something about culture. So I'm gonna say a bit about that. So as I said earlier, um, um, my life experiences have given me a 
a good view on things that are kind of universal across human cultures and things that might that may vary. Um, and when we think about the ways in which cultures vary, it's very easy to um, to think of cultural variations as just these random things that happen through history, um, these curiosities uh, and things that don't really have any um, clear connection to human evolution. And in many cases, as I'll show you, there may be a more systematic way in which we can explain cultural variation. And linking this to disease, um, we've known for a while that regions of the world uh, vary in um, the extent to which they um, have diseases. This is called pathogen prevalence. And this relates mostly to climate um, and um, how humid places are. So usually the hotter and more humid places have more pathogens. This is just facts of um, biology. And because these things have um, persisted for a long time, it's very likely that they may also have um, shaped the way culture is developed. So one um, example of this is there's been a, a link found between pathogen prevalence of uh, rural regions and their cuisines. So um, if you look at the different cuisines around the world and the extent to which they use spices, there's a correlation. And the reason this um, was even tested in the first place is it's been known that um, many spices like uh, garlic and onion and pepper and so on are naturally antibiotic. So the reason humans kind of started this in the first place, putting spices in, on their meats, was to try to suppress germs before refrigeration. And it turns out we do this more in the hotter regions with more pathogens. So if you want to have nice spicy food, you get Thai, Indian, Jamaican, not uh, German or Norwegian. Um, more interestingly, pathogen prevalence also correlates with um, this variation known as um, collectivism. So you may have heard of individualism, collectivism. This explains um, the tendencies for societies to kind of prioritize individual autonomy and rights and freedom versus more collective um, values, uh, cooperation, um, conformity. And it turns out the more pathogen prevalent regions have societies that are more collectivistic because collectivism kind of um, um, is conducive to sticking to your norms and not, not being too um, innovative and um, just being less risk-taking. Um, in a more specific test of um, the different kinds of moral norms that people have, um, studies have found that there's this correlation between pathogen prevalence and how much you uphold moral, moral norms that are about groups. So, it, so these are things like, um, if you think about what's uh, right and what's not right, um, how relevant is um, things like uh, obeying authority or um, being loyal to your group or um, um, making sure that your your family and your group are, um, uh, you know, the extent to which you're religious, for example, um, these things correlate with pathogen prevalence. And in one attempt to, to come up with a single dimension of cultural variation, Gelfand and colleagues uh, proposed that cultures vary in what they call tightness. So, um, Tight cultures are those in which um, there are strong norms and there's um, people are discouraged from deviating from these norms. And the, on the opposite side, you have loose cultures in which it's fine to be individuals, uh, um, uh, be very different, innovative. And so basically in tight cultures, there are more ways to be inappropriate and more ways to do things in, in the wrong way. Um, so they can measure tightness through various means. And um, in the sample they collected, just to give you examples, um, a country like South Korea, where I was born, is a very tight culture. So there, there's a lot of um, restrictions on social behavior. And the, on the opposite side, a country like the Netherlands, where I also spend time, is a very loose culture. The UK happens to be right in the middle in terms of tightness, looseness. And this correlates with uh, pathogen prevalence. And if you think about something like social conformity, how much people tend to conform to what others are doing. Um, you may have uh, seen or heard of the Solomon Ash conformity paradigm in psychology where people are shown these lines of different lengths and they have to match that with a, a sample line. And when they are in a study where um, they are um, in a room full of others, other participants that are actually actors, and they all give wrong responses, the participants also give wrong responses to, to conform 
And when they do this um, uh, across cultures, they find the correlation. So the, the more pattern prevalent the culture is, the more people tend to conform in these ASH um, style experiments. If you also measure how important um, people think it is to obey authority, that correlates with pattern prevalence as well. So the um, priorita prioritization of obedience. This one's an interesting one. So it's not about what kinds of personality traits you have, but the extent to which people's personality traits vary at all in a society. So if I were to give um, a measure of, for example, um, introversion, extroversion in this room, we get a spread of scores, introverts, extroverts. And if you do this with larger samples, you can get a sense of how variable people are on that dimension. And what's interesting is if you do this in countries that are more um, prevalent in pathogens, that variation is smaller, meaning people stick closer to the norm, whatever the norm happens to be. And in a more behavioral measure of uh, sticking to norms, if you measure the proportion of people that are left-handed, that correlates with pathogen prevalence. And why is that? Because um, handedness is very much genetic. It's something you're born with. But in cultures where they put more emphasis on conforming and, and, and obedience, um, there's a stronger tendency in those societies for parents and schools to force left-handed kids to become right-handed. So in more loose and free cultures, left-handers stay left-handed but in more tight and collectivistic cultures, a lot of these left-handers are forced to become right-handers. And so this is why we see a correlation between the two. So just to summarize um, all of that, um, I talked about psychological adaptations against disease, the relevance this has for understanding disgust, why it exists, um, and how this then leads to ideas about the kinds of people we avoid and the cues that we um, um, use to avoid people and how there's a, a false positive bias, which may explain stigmatization of um, individuals who have features that deviate from norms, how this might then have implications for prejudice, personality and individual differences, and also things like prejudice, stigmatization, and even political ideology. And last, I talked about some of these mind-body links, for example, the effect of pregnancy, tactile sensitivity, and um, the possibility that we can prime the immune system. So thank you. And if you have any further questions or um, information about, uh, if you'd like information about the papers, that's my email. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Justin. So many questions. Yes. The 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 uh, chat room is buzzing, yeah. but before before we go into the chat room, I'm sure there will be lots of observations, comments, questions in the room. So who would like to go first? Okay, there's a gentleman here at the front. If you could just speak directly into the mic, otherwise people can't hear you online. Um, thank you very much, a fascinating talk. Um, one question I have is how much do you see, or do you see disgust in other animal species? Yeah. Like apes or monkeys or uh, yeah. mammals? That's a very, very good question. Um, so we do see behavioral parallels in other species. So one example of this is, um, um, when Jane Goodall spent time in, in Africa with um, these troops of chimpanzees, there was one time uh, an outbreak of polio, which made some of these chimps um, kind of limp around um, abnormally, and the other chimps would stay away from, from this limping chimp. Now, the problem, with, um, the difficulty we have, of course, is we can't ask animals, what do you feel? So all we have are these behavioral um, examples that appear as though they are motivated to avoid something, what we don't know is the subjective experience they have, whether it's anything like our disgust. I think if um, for something very fundamental like disgust and fear, anxiety, a good guess is um, um, species that are fairly close to us evolutionarily, like chimpanzees and other mammals, probably have sub subjective experiences that are similar to ours as well, but it's only a guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the room? Okay. Hi, thank you for a fantastic talk. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, but you talked about we go from disgust to aversion. And then is the next human instinct, is it flight or is it aggression then? Because I could see when the HIV crisis was going on and yes. you showed some examples about it turning to violence to eradicate the problem. Um, yeah. Are we still hopefully programmed that we 
flee from these <laughs> issues? Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't think of these different kinds of responses as being on a kind of hierarchy, but just as being different programs that are triggered by um, different kinds of information. So um, just depending on what um, you perceive as being more urgent and um, immediate threat or need, this will trigger different responses. Generally speaking, the things that, um, so motives that humans have where we need to approach something. So these are the appetitive motives like finding food, finding mates, finding allies and so on. These things tend to get um, kind of overridden by the, the avoidance motives like fear, anxiety, disgust, because it's um, usually far more um, uh, adaptive to avoid immediate threats than to try to pursue something that could benefit you eventually. Um, so I think there have been some attempts to, to study this, to see which, which of these responses are more um, immediate. So I would say uh, probably fear is um, um, more immediate in, in the sense that it triggers a more immediate response, whereas disgust can be more uh, kind of a longer lasting thing over time. Um, so yeah, and, and your, your point about whether disgust leads onto like flight um, um, avoidance, fleeing, that probably depends on the, the level of threat that you perceive. So if someone comes at you um, with uh, cues of disease, then very likely you will flee. But if, um, if, if that threat is not that imminent, then it may be that you kind of uh, keep an eye on that, but then get on with um, your other concerns. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that, but that has, I mean, Yeah, I, th I think um, there are different um, trade-offs to every behavior. So, you know, we don't, um, we don't go around killing people because these have consequences uh, for ourselves and for others, right? So, um, but we, we, we have um, spent a lot of um, resources and time and money in, um, for example, quarantining people in the, during the pandemic. So of course we didn't kill individuals, but we kept them separated um, for extended periods. Um, yeah, so I think um, the actual behavior that we observe, um, there are so many factors that go into it. So here we're just talking about the more fundamental things that occur in, in the kind of first instance of uh, interaction that we see. Um, for example, when you see someone with a birthmark, you might have this aversive response. Once you meet them and get to know them, the next time you meet them, it may not be an issue at all. And so you know, we have more complex interactions. Okay, we're gonna to go to some questions online. Bear with me. Right, let's have a look. Uh, we've got a question here. Might the disgust response transfer over to people with disabilities? And do we really think we can catch disabilities? Yeah, so I think I mentioned disabilities in, in one slide, just in the sense that um, the more you um, are concerned about diseases, your higher, the higher your disgust sensitivity, um, the higher prejudice you show against people with disabilities. It's not that we think we can catch disabilities. It's never um, at that level. Even with something that's more obvious like uh, influenza and so on, it, um, it's only in the past um, two, 300 years that humans have figured out that there are these pathogens that cause infections and, and, and diseases. Um, this is known as the germ theory of disease. Um, but we've had these responses for much longer uh, without ever knowing how we catch things. So what we're talking about here are these intuitive responses um, that we have, despite knowing that we, we don't catch disabilities, we don't catch obesity. Um, so it's just interesting that we see these responses despite the knowledge that we still, we have at this point. Okay, there's another question online. Uh, I assume homeliness is used in the American sense. So somebody would like a definition of what you meant by homeliness. Yeah, so, I mean, um, to put it bluntly, that would have been ugliness, but we didn't want to have that in the title of the paper. So, um, yeah, the definition would be ugliness, unattractiveness. Okay. There's another question. There's another statement, actually. It seems vital to distinguish between social attitudes and genetic disgust markers. I'm not sure what was meant by genetic disgust markers, but... Um, I think I think the the question is you know do we need to make a distinction between what are genetic markers for of disgust and how that translates into social attitudes? 
Yes, so one thing I haven't said very much about is the extent to which these responses may be kind of innate and hardwired um, versus um, more shaped by socialization, our environments, um, and the context more generally. Now, I didn't get into that too much because um, it's a bit of a minefield and it's very difficult to make sense of. There's a natural tendency that people have um, when they hear about something having evolved to assume that it must therefore be kind of hardwired and we have no control over it. But that's not what's necessarily implied by evolutionary psychology. So um, we have all kinds of responses that have origins in our evolution um, without it meaning that we have no control over them. We can't help but you know, engage in these behaviors. Most of the things we do through our daily our day are driven by these basic motives, but we uh, at every moment have the the, the, the um, ability to control our behaviors and the outcomes. So um, we don't always do the most rational thing, but um, um, depending on on yeah, things that you have learned and acquired and 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 so on, um, um, yeah, we we can overcome these you know, very basic responses. Okay, um, and just the fact that um, cultural variation happens at all shows that these things are not hardwired. So if you grew up in a region that's um, relatively pathogen um, non-prevalent, then these responses will tend to be down-regulated. Mm -hmm. And so you see less prejudice and, and so on. So um, I think that just shows that we are quite flexible and these responses are not, not okay. hardwired. Good. Another, another interesting question is, is social conservatism positively correlated with neuroticism? It's a good question. I can't remember the exact data on this, but I would imagine that there is a, at least a small correlation between those. Because um, yeah, neuroticism is associated with um, um, anxiety, worrying about things, and I, I can see how that would have a small correlation with conservatism. Not a strong one, but yeah. Yeah, I should have added it's a small C, not, uh, not uh, the capital C yeah. we're talking yeah. about. Good. Anybody else in the room? Yes, this gentleman here. Well, I start with a brief anecdote, really. It made me think, you made me think about a situation. I found myself um, living with some river people in Burma, Myanmar, on boats as the pandemic took off and was ultimately asked to leave. I was the only foreigner to leave the community because the fear was I was the source of the virus, which I perfectly accepted. But my question really was, is there any association with um, superstition and pathogen prevalence areas? Um, so and and, and, is, and, is, and is, ex is extreme superstition a false positive? But I can see yeah. that it could be adaptive, but yes. Yeah. Um, arguments have been made about um, how various superstitions um, uh, and religious kinds of beliefs and also um, conspiratorial beliefs may be examples of these like false positive biases. And, the, and you can see how that happens because um, when something bad happens, let's say there's a crop failure or some flood in your environment um, and you don't know what, what caused it. So let's say you're you know, back in um, a thousand years ago and you don't know what's causing these outcomes. You might think that there's some agents, some witch in your community that's causing these bad outcomes. So you can assume there's a witch causing these outcomes, which is a false positive, or you can assume it's just a, a random event. And if there happened to be an actual agent, then you have committed a false negative. So, so along those lines, people have argued that it may have um, been more adaptive to assume that events are not random and caused by um, agents like supernatural being or, or a witch or some, yeah. And this may then um, promote you know, these beliefs and superstitions and conspiracy theories. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions in the room? There's a couple more questions online. Anybody in the room wants to ask another question? Ah, second question. Okay. Still going online as well. So. Um, just very good, quick, quick moment. If you have an awareness of, of your kind of disgust sensitivity, do you think that can help um, in terms of your maybe your political views? Um, in, does it help to know that this mechanism exists? Um, yeah, my, my personal sense is it definitely helps. Um, I think anytime you become aware of uh, 
your subjective states um, from the perspective of an, of an outsider. Be generally speaking, we go out about our day without ever thinking um, that our, our reality is could be any different. But if you, if you realize that what you're feeling is one possible kind of emotional response and there are other possible responses, then you can see how um, uh, what you're feeling may not be necessarily objective and then maybe scrutinize your attitudes a bit more. So I mean, I'm sure it can help. Um, but I'm, I'm also aware of a lot of people um, when they are kind of um, nudged toward, you know, being told that they have these biased and um, ideological views that they have, they resist very strongly because most people don't want to believe that they, uh, they are biased. So all of us think we are objective, everyone else is ideological, right? So yes, yeah, so I think it, it can go both ways. Okay. And I knew we were going to get a question about spices, ultimately. And this is, well, actually, it's not a question, it's an observation. There seems to be an important distinction between disguising the taste of off meat with spices and using spices as antibiotics. Yeah, I, I don't think the suggestion is that um, we're trying to disguise like rotting meat with spices. It's just using spices to prevent um, meat from rotting in the first place. Excellent. So I have carte blanche and using spicy spices in my food in the future. Yeah. Great. Anything, anybody else in the room? And I'll have a look whether there's anything online. Otherwise, we'll draw things. Oh, there's one, one quite long one online. But does anybody in the room want to ask a question before I go to online? No? Uh, Kate is asking, don't the findings about the link between pathogens prevalence in countries and tightness and conformity contradict the earlier referenced findings about neuroticism? Yeah, so I think we're talking about slightly different things here. So the desire to um, avoid others through being neurotic um, um, is not necessarily contradictory to having a society where people are generally more conforming and cooperative with each other. So I don't think they're contradictory. Um, I don't know if I can give a better answer than that at this point. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's when there is a pathogen prevalence, p a communities try to be tighter together yeah. and exclude others as That's opposed right, yeah. to the other way around. At the very same time, the individuals can be a bit more neurotic than they might have been otherwise, yeah. Unless anybody's got another question, I think we're going to draw things to a conclusion. And please, please put your hands together. Fantastic, fantastic, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.